Hey guys, I'm in uh, Putrajaya, uh, Malaysia, and this is the Pink Mosque. It's beautiful. There's also a, um, a Pink Mosque in uh, Iran. Uh, they're not the same thing. This is, you know, quite beautiful. And it's right on the water. Uh, I haven't had a chance to go there yet. Uh, so maybe we'll just walk around until I find a, a path. Um, and in the meantime, I wanted to, since it's, it's, an, it's an election year um, in, the, in the US, and there's a lot of lessons to be picked up from that. Um, one of them is, you know, the perennial battle between socialism and capitalism. And let's just go through all the different arguments and all the different approaches one by one. Uh, there aren't that many. Um, they can all be boiled down to like three or four approaches. Um, the first one is what I call the personal responsibility approach. That approach basically says that we follow the, we follow the rules. Um, in some cases, we may have had a hand in making the rules, but... For the most part, we follow the rules. Um, we did what we were supposed to do. Um, and as a result of that, uh, we earned our place, oftentimes in these beautiful houses, um, you know, uh, away from a lot of other people. And the reason that people over there on the other side of town are worse off than we are is because of a multitude of factors. One is just time. Uh, maybe they're immigrants. Sometimes it takes a couple of generations to build up wealth. Uh, number two, um, you know, bad habits. A lot of times people, it used to be blamed uh, people for uh, cigarettes and alcohol. Uh, and now it's, you know, you're poor because you spend $5 on a Starbucks latte. Um, and all those have some merit. Um, you know, alcohol, of course, probably doesn't help improve productivity. Um, and one of the things I like about Malaysia is that as a Muslim country, you don't really see drunk people. On, on a Friday night or a Saturday night. Uh, you, have to, you don't have to worry so much about DUIs, partly because you, <laughs> if, you, if you drive drunk anywhere in Southeast Asia, except for Singapore, you, you're probably gonna die, um, you know, with or without, well, even with a little bit of alcohol because it's such a maze. This is the nicest part of town in KL that I've been to. All the roads are not like that uh, elsewhere. Um, for the most part, you really have to be alert. Uh, and it's like a, it's like what I call a moving zone defense in basketball. You're sort of working together with, with everybody else um, on the road to get where, to where you need to be. Um, so that's the first approach. And it's a convenient approach, uh, but it's no less true than any of the other approaches. It's important to remember as we go through the other approaches, that to remember that the first approach is true. People do uh, have more money than other people because they save, they put it, they invest in index funds, and so on. Um, that's not an accident. They do end up having sometimes fewer children. They do make wise spending decisions. So, let's move on to the second one, which is also no less true, which is why we have debates, um, and which is why it's important to make sure that we are sort of, we analyze each of these approaches logically. The other approach uh, is, well, you know, it's not as if you happen to gain a special understanding of finance and education and all these things on your own. You either were lucky enough to be born into a family that taught you these things, or into a school district that taught you these things, or into a neighborhood that had enough books to teach you these things. And that randomness, uh, what a philosopher, I think Nozick, I always get Nozick and Rawls, John Rawls mixed up, um, so apologies. Um, but one of them had something called the veil of ignorance. Um, and, and, and basically the idea is that, that a just society is a society where ultimately, it had to be Rawls, probably, it's gotta be Rawls, is a just society um, where ultimately you're in a position where you uh, can judge a society based on um, the idea that if you had to start from a position of zero, with zero knowledge of what you would become in the future, of what position you would be, whether a maid, bartender, uh, security guard, police officer, or president, uh, that you would create a society that, where the rules were designed from a starting point uh, of randomness and ignorance, a veil of ignorance that blocks your ability to see uh, you know, whether or not you'd be living in one of these houses or um, 
interesting. It's not a gated, it's not a gated community, but it's clearly it's private property. I saw a no trespassing sign back there. Uh, there's no security guard. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, there's no, uh, no admittance inside, but this is a public street. Uh, so that's the, the veil of ignorance. And so the idea behind the second approach is it's all, a lot of us, a lot of your position is based on randomness. If you happen to have been born to a single mother in the slums of some country, you would not be in the position you're in. And furthermore, a lot of where you are is based on what the country has done for you. In other words, you know, if you happen to be in Japan, Switzerland, um, where else, America, with the US dollar, and today, the, the EU, uh, ultimately, you're in a position where the uh, what your spending power, and therefore your investment power, and therefore your savings, um, are ultimately decided by factors that are far beyond your control, regardless of the fact that you follow, followed all the rules. So, that's the second approach. Um, the third approach is something I don't like. I'll just explain it anyway. Third approach is, well, you know, we have people that are, that are not as good as we are. That's really the underlying sort of uh, assumption. These, these people over there, they're not as good as we are. They were born with a mental defect. Not, they don't say that. They say that they're basically just not good enough. And there's a lot of people that are not good enough. And people have said this for a long time, not just, you know, um, you know not just uh, from all walks of life. W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, talked about the talented 10th and how the top 10% of every society are the ones that um, essentially create the society that we live in. And so the idea is you've got this bottom 90%, though nobody really says it that way. Recently, people talked about 40% of the, of the population in the, in the US uh, essentially not paying taxes, uh, not paying certain taxes, certain national taxes, um, and therefore, uh, you know, sort of dragging down everyone else um, down. Um, so, uh, another, I think there's another Mercedes right in front of me. Actually, that's uh oh no, that's a beautiful car. I don't know what it is, Honda. Honda makes the best small cars. If I were living in Southeast Asia, I would just pick a Honda. Um, Mid-size would be Toyota. So, um, ultimately, so the third argument basically comes around, comes down to there are these other people, we have to live with them. Uh, and ultimately, you know, it's, it's also sometimes a combination with the second argument that maybe you're born disabled. Maybe you're born into a situation where, you know, you don't have a high IQ or you don't have something where, um, you know, all, all, but ultimately, regardless of what happens, we have to have compassion uh, because, you know, a lot of where we are is based on luck. Don't like that argument. Uh, and, you know, therefore, you know, we have to have more welfare. We have to have, um, so we have to look, look beyond merit um, for the most part. And determining, and determining what the rules uh, should be. Um, I don't like that argument. It's a charitable argument, and charity doesn't always work. It only works when GDP is increasing. Uh, the minute people start to feel poor, uh, poorer, especially in the majority, um, that charity becomes the last thing on, on their minds. So that, to me, is the weakest argument. Uh, if anything, it, it sets up a clash between the majority and the minority. Um, his majority, and by, when I say majority, I just mean whoever has p political power. It could be that the majority is actually a minority under some sort of apartheid situation. Um, so that's the third argument. The fourth argument is the one that I really is probably want to spend the most time on. The fourth argument is essentially that where we are is a combination of many different things, and you cannot ignore history. Even if you are, say, a refugee, uh, let's say that you're in the, in the U.S., well, ultimately, maybe you got there because your grandfather was involved in a war and was a refugee or uh, was involved on the offensive side of it um, and, and won the war. But you don't know when a war starts whether you're going to be on the winning side or the, or the losing side. And throughout much of history, where we end up has been based on the, you know, who's got the biggest guns. And if you look at it that way um, and who's able to set the rules of the financial system. See, people on the other arguments talk about setting the rules for social behavior. They don't, they always seem to forget that there's another whole dimension uh, based on history and finance um, that essentially sets up a lot of opportunities that are foreclosed to other people um, based on randomness, um, but not really randomness. Uh, it's based on a series of decisions made by leaders. Uh, and so you can easily imagine a world where you know, say Japan won World War II, um, the whole world would look different. 
Um, and we don't know when you're born, say in 1935 or 1925, or even in 1941, um, you know, whether, you know, which side you're going to be on. And for the most part, you know, most of us are unfortunately um, sort of swept up in a tide of history that we don't have much control over. But we do know that when things go south, you know, a lot of people end up leaving uh, and taking their money with them. And a lot of that happens through different groups. I mean, you can call them religious groups. Uh, you can call them international organizations. Um, I mean, one of the reasons Jeff Bezos, uh, who's the founder of Amazon, exists is because, um, or is this in the way that he does today, is because his father was a refugee that was settled by a uh, nonprofit that was funded by a religious organization that ironically supported the Vietnam War. In other words, the Catholic Church installed a dictator. Well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I, I get older, I start using, I start realizing I have to be a little bit more careful with what, what words I use. They installed a political um, leader that uh, represented their interests in the South, and they basically used their influence in the government uh, to go to war, uh, to support that Southern breakaway uh, territory that was um, designed for the Catholic uh, Church's expanded influence. Of course, um, that war failed, but because, because they lost, you know, you had a lot of situations where um, the fight against communism then spread. It had been spreading for quite some time after 1945, financially and economically, and so you, most people don't make that connection between, say, a Cuban uh, coming to the United States um, and becoming and marrying, uh, becoming the stepfather uh, to Jeff Bezos. They don't make that connection between, say, something like the Vietnam War. But in many cases, like I said, because we're oftentimes swept up in the tide of history, these events go together. And larger organizations oftentimes fight it out. And if you're in Cuba, you know, if you're white, if you're black, um, you know, things have different, you know, there's differences uh, that go back many, many generations based on decisions you had nothing to do with. Um, and so you've got, say, you know, a Cuban refugee uh, coming to the United States, being resettled, uh, again, by the same, you know, eventual uh, backer uh, that, you know, supported another war that created even more refugees. And so you look around, and so that's the, the genesis, or, the, or it's sort of the foundation of that fourth argument, which is beautiful, uh, is... This idea that not only is a lot of our um, situation today based on randomness, but a lot of it is based on factors that are beyond our control that are not really random. Uh, it's history. And who, has, who had the biggest guns a long time ago? So when you look at it this way, uh, inequality starts to look less benign. It starts to look less like a merit-based result than a multitude of factors combining together. Um, so the question is, once we understand all these things, how do we create a way forward politically? Sometimes it's difficult. Uh, sometimes, like I said, um, you know, when it doesn't work out, you have a revolution, you have refugees, you have war. It's becoming difficult today to think about war because weapons have now increased to the point where um, a lot of war will become automated. It will become based on software, based on hacking, and not based on massive fighter jets. And in other words, who can predict? A lot of it will come down to what we sort of predictability uh, based on who has better intelligence. So data, for example, that's actually why the United States is, is opposing Huawei, a telecom company from China, from coming in, because it knows that data is the most precious asset. So of course, you have to know what to do with that data. Um, but you look around and you think to yourself, where do we go from here? Do we need more international cooperation, less international cooperation? Uh, how do we create a win-win situation? And I don't know the answers. Um, it's, you know, coming to a really nice neighborhood like this one. It's quiet. Um, I mean, there's really very few people around. They're probably all at work. Um, brand new condos right by the lake, so it's a little bit cooler. Um, 
you look around and you sort of think that, you know, I, you know, by the way, on the way here, a lot of people in Southeast Asia um, have nannies from the Philippines. Uh, so <laughs> a lot of children grow up with a Filipino nanny uh, taking care of them. And that's one of the reasons why it's easier, easier to have children. That's obviously not something that um, most people in Europe or in, in the United States have, have access to. But of course, that all, a lot of that comes down to the labor involved that is priced lower than a lot of other labor, not necessarily based on merit, but just, it's just based on something like, say, overpopulation. You can see how all these factors come together uh, in ways that quite often don't make any sense. Hmm. Hmm. No smell. Um, and so one of the reasons I'm traveling is to try to make sense of it. Uh, and it's becoming, you know, sort of more and more difficult. Uh, huh. So anyway, here we are. It's just a really nice neighborhood. Um, so hopefully that, that, that four layer foundation at least gives people a, a, some, some sort of, you know, basis for further discussion. Um, this is the province flag. Uh, I think it is actually. Uh, let's see. This is, yeah. There, there are different states in Malaysia. Uh, I'm trying to remember all of them. Sabah, uh, Sarawak. Those are the two ones that are most independent, I think. They may have gotten more Chinese investment from abroad. Um, and so I'm blanking now. I, sh I should know what that one is. Um, but but I'm, I'm sort of blanking right now. Um, and so a lot of that, by the way, depends on you know whether or not you get that foreign investment depends on whether you happen to be in a, in a place that has oil uh, palm oil or petroleum uh, or in a country that has that access so you look around and you realize that all these things sort of go together and most of us um, have to try to figure out a way to ensconce ourselves within whatever trend happens to be going up um, that could be something like working for apple but if there's no apple uh, or Google in your neighborhood, you can't do that. That's changing. A lot of a lot of jobs are going online, but for the most part, you know, wealth tends to be handed down, um, and so you don't end up in a position where, uh, you know, wherever you are, uh, you don't end up in a position where anybody can really say that, you know, they are. Very few people can, by the way. There are some people who can definitely say, "I got here my way and on my own," and God bless them. Um, but you know, most people cannot make that argument, and so. That's always sort of the problem, right? Is that, you know, the argument that I would make is sort of a combination of all these four. I would say, ultimately, whoever lives in your country, within your country's borders, whether legal or illegal, if you're not in a position where there is social cohesion, eventually, whether you're in the top 10% or the bottom 10%, eventually things won't work out for anybody. Because without social cohesion, which requires some basis for merit, and some basis, basis for respect, some um, logical and voluntary basis for respect. Ultimately, all these inequalities, which typically cannot be fixed within one generation, or maybe even two or three, uh, they will persist. And they won't be fixable within our lifetimes. And so if you're in the top 10, whether you got there because you, you, know, you followed all the rules or you were in a position to make the rules, uh, for the most part, you know, or in the bottom 10%, because even though you're working eight hours a day, you know, planting lemon or cultivating lemongrass, and you have 0% body fat uh, in some Indonesian jungle, you know, yeah, ultimately, you know, you're in a position where, you know, prices and pay don't always make sense. And so if they don't make sense all the time, then in that case, you're in a position where you really do have to try to figure out, you know, where it is, uh, how, how you want to move forward. And you can't move forward without social cohesion. And that means that if you don't have that, everything we just talked about, one, two, three, four, it all becomes irrelevant. And so really the question is, you know, that gets us into, th into things like censorship. Do you censor people that speak badly of, um, say, Muslims in Malaysia or Filipinas? in you know, other countries in order to protect the minority. How far do you go? And this is something that uh, Western, or ev everyone, everyone is trying to figure out because, but especially in the West, because you know, the East never claimed to prioritize freedom of speech above everything else. 
Um, and so the West is really in a crisis point with respect to, to social cohesion because it has claimed certain values uh, above others. Uh, it has claimed that this, that this system was superior because of its respect for freedom of speech. And now we're finding out that that may not be the case. So where do we go from there? So anyway, something to think about. Uh, but at least you, uh, if you get a, get a chance to travel, I say go for it.